Hey everybody. So I released this video um, the other day for a very short time um, and then I, I had to make it private. So one of my viewers, clever viewers, had pointed out that I had said some information that perhaps could be wrong or taken the wrong way. So I'm re-recording this and I will jump in um, and explain what I meant by it. But then I also want to tell everybody I'm not a doctor, obviously. And I will be saying this at the beginning of videos. She just didn't want me to get in trouble. So I thank her for that. Um, but I, I'm not going to take it out. But I am going to explain more what I meant by it. So this is from the other day. If and It wasn't up long. So if you heard it, I would suggest listening to it again because it's a good story. If not, um, this is the one from the other day that people were asking me about. So let's enjoy. Hey, guys. So I am beyond happy that I'm able to get another one of these videos out because as I've said, you know, I was a little sidetracked with everything, but now that I'm on a schedule, I'm able to do that. So this is Sunday and and also just real quick, I was um, very exhausted yesterday. So I'm a day because these usually will be coming out on Wednesdays and Sundays. I was just exhausted yesterday. I don't know why. So I'm, that's why I'm a day late with these. So Wednesday schedule. So um, let's get started. We are stronger than yesterday. I just skipped by that by mistake. I got to give it a little bit more time. I don't need to give it more time so everybody can, you know, read it. I needed to give it need to give it more time because it deserves it. So there we have it. Okay, so this is um this is a longer one, so that's good. So this is going to be just one story. And like I said, I don't mind if they're shorter ones or longer ones. It's just if they're longer ones, they're going to have their own episode. If they're shorter ones, I can fit, I can fit several into, into one video. First off, I'd like to extend a huge thank you for making that video about the douche, the douche and duchess and their crusade on phony mental health struggles. It is phony and it's disgusting. They're pathetic. I think you are really strong and brave to put it all out there. And I'm grateful you don't make it sound like something to be ashamed of, as I often feel a lot of people are still ashamed. It's not something to be ashamed of. Um, you know, you can't help it. I mean, it's not like it's something that you went out and got or made a bad mis or it's not like you went and made a bad mis ma bad decision and then you have a health mental health condition. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, my whole thing on mental health is you just have to get help for it. If you don't get help for your mental condition, then, you know, then you shouldn't lean on it. I mean, as long as you're getting help and taking care of yourself, it's absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. Some people are afraid to get help, help so I don't mean anything like that. It's just, it's a, um, it's a, it's an, it's an illness. It's a condition and something that used to drive me crazy when be like, people would be like, it's just like diabetes. Well, no, it's not because nobody, you know, gets weird if you tell them you have diabetes, but it is a, a medical condition because the brain is a muscle. Um, it just needs constantly taken care of and watched. As you stated, those of us who struggle do not wish to advertise all of the events in our lives that led us to experience something so raw and real. You really hurt, hit a nerve with me. I don't feel like anything happens by chance, and I do believe I was meant to stumble on your channel. Yay! If anything, if anything, to know that there is a chick out there in the world who is similar to me in many ways is comforting. Yes, and that's the point of, point of all this, and there's more than just one chick that is struggle, struggling and having similar issues. Again, whether that's with addiction, alcoholism, mental health, I hope no one's being abused, but I'm sure there are some out there. You know, it's just all, it's just all struggling, and we're all together. I get, I guess I grav gravitate what, to what you stand for, or I guess I grav gravitate to what you stand for, is because I am not as brave as you. Yes, you are. I just have this channel, and I wouldn't be as brave if I didn't know my audience was supportive. I mean, if I thought you guys were a bunch of jerks. I never would have been open about it. I mean, you're only as brave as, as, as uh, the good people, you know, you, you can only be so brave. I mean, if you had a bunch of jerks around you, 
know, it's easy to be it's easy to be brave if you have good people around you. That's what I'm saying. As I type this out, I have tears running down my face, which it's good to cry. That is, I hate to keep interrupting her, but some people don't want to let themselves cry. Well, it's the purge. It's the release. It's not a sign of weakness. It's 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 a purge. It's like it, it, you've got to get it out. It's a physical relief. You guys know that. Um, I'm just overwhelmed with emotions and anger and shame. Like you, I did not ask to be the way I am. And to know that these assholes are exploiting actual pain and anguish and shame by using their lies as emotional blackmail for whatever underhanded agenda in mind. And something that's important for us to share is that there are real people out there struggling and these people are just exploiting it. So the more and more, you know, the more people that come out, even including celebrities, the stigma goes down less. And then you can, you know, Harry and Meghan aren't the only ones who are exploiting mental health. You know, there's people in our day-to-day -day lives that exploit it or don't have it. And they'll say, oh, like I said, some people will just think, oh, I am so bipolar. Oh, I'm my ADD. And oh, you know, no. There's every there's a lot of people that exploit it, not just those two. They're just doing it on an industrial scale. Um, let me see where was I. And to know that there are these assholes exploiting actual pain and anguish and shame by using their lies as emotional blackmail for whatever under, underhanded agenda in mind, it really pisses me off. It totally negates the absolute torture I've put myself through on my path to healing. It negates those of us who have lived our lives on the edge of happiness and despair and creates this bullshit victim attitude. Exactly. It's like, you know, the racism card. You know, people get sick of hearing that. There's real racism out there. And if everybody screams everything's racist or you're a racist, then the real racists and the real racism gets lost in the sea of all the, the garbage and the just, you know, using racism as a, as a tool. Um, it negates those of us who have lived our lives on the edge of happiness and despair, and it creates this bullshit victim attitude. Anyway, you asked for a story, I will tell you mine. You can refer to me as the Countess, and you can do what you will with my story. I am not a professional writer, none of us are, and I don't mean to sound dramatic with my descriptions. Don't worry about it. You're just, I'm sure if it's factual, it's dramatic. I mean, it's just, you know, it's what it is. I am being fueled by emotions right now, and this is all coming out as I think of it. Well, good. I grew up with a fantastic childhood and family. Like every family, though, mine carried a deep-rooted and genetic secret of mental illness. I have a narcissist for a mother, and I've spent my life trying to rise to her standards and have taken her criticisms to heart and let them destroy my self-esteem. I do not believe my mom is the way she is because she's gone through s s some shit. Or no, I do believe my mom is the way she is because she has gone through some shit. She's gone through some shit during, her, during a time where if a woman had a mental illness, she was shipped off to the loony ward, which is unfortunate. I'm so glad we're not um, there. You know, they just used to just lock people. They used to do a lot of uh, terrible things to mental illness. I had a, you know, an aunt, my grandmother's sister was just shipped off. And I'll do a, a history of bipolar, not bipolar, of mental illness. And actually the British people are the ones that started treating people with mental health conditions like human beings. So, you know, it's just funny, Harry and Meghan, and the sugars all say how, you know, racist the Brits are. Not true. Um, you know, there's obviously individual ones, but it, the society as whole, they were the first ones to start doing the slavery turnaround and, and all of that, as they were with mental health and the treatment of them. I'll do one of those. When you're in the hospital, folks, they... They teach you about medicine, they teach you about the history of it, they teach you, you know, you learn about the, the people with all different types of conditions in the hospital, which is great, so you can understand it. Um, where, okay, she was shipped off to the loony, world, war, loony ward. All trauma and pain 
had to be swept under the rug and never spoken of again. As I became an adult and have under as I've become an, an adult and have undergone intense therapy, I can now see my mom as a person. I acknowledge that she did the best she knew how to cope. What did she have to cope with? Well, a few years after my parents got married, my grandmother, her mother, died in her arms. It wasn't a death caused by anyone or anything besides her own actions. My mom came over to my mom came over to her mom's house, walked in the door, and saw her mother chugging a bottle of Drano. Which they have now, I learned, in the hospital, like, you can't, they have made, I'm not sure how old this person is, but it's very hard to kill yourself with household cleaners now, um, medicine, like psychiatric medicine. Really, you can't OD on Tylenol anymore and die. I mean, you if you tried to take a, if you took a whole bottle of Tylenol, you're going to get sick, but they've made it so it can't kill you anymore. Like, they've taken measures of, you know. Um, okay, so that's the part. What I meant by that was, um, if you would, uh, and I learned this in the hospital, if you would take a bottle, a whole bottle of Tylenol <clears throat> to kill yourself, or, and they said, you know, because sometimes in the hospital, you know, people, you know, they, they let you out when they think that you're not a danger to others or danger to yourself, but, you know, you know, they can't be 100% sure that somebody's going to leave the hospital and not try and do something to themselves. So they said that if you would take a bottle of all your medicine or, you know, a bottle of Tylenol, it's not going to kill you right away like it did in the old days. I, I, I'm not, I don't mean that it's not going to cause you damage or she had mentioned or liver or kidney damage or things like that. It's just not going to kill you immediately, like within a half hour or something. I guess there's some sort of coding on this. Um, and, you know, like I said, I'm not a doctor, but I believe what they told us, there's some sort of coding where it's not coding on the pills, where it's not going to kill you immediately. Hopefully somebody will find you in time. So that's what I meant. And, and, and with household cleaners and everything, these companies wised up because they knew that people were trying, were killing themselves with all this stuff. So they've done, to the best of my knowledge and as how I understand it, they've just done stuff to the formulas where it's not going to kill you right away. You're probably going to get sick. No, you're definitely going to get sick and you'll probably do some damage to your body. It's just not going to be an immediate death. That's what I meant by that. So wanted to clear that up. You'll get very sick, but however they've changed their, their uh, formulas. She rushed over to her mother and tried her best to make her sick and throw it up while she called 911 for help. She was too late and her mother died in her lap. Foaming at the, ma foaming at the mouth. So this she... story, based on that this is this woman's mother, you know, this was probably a long time ago. So it was her grandmother, so that's a long time ago. He took her last breath. I never knew about this situation until about 10 years ago. I knew my grandma committed suicide, but I never knew the actual or details of the whole event. My mom was left to pick up the pieces and care for her father, my grandpa, for the rest of his life. She in turn, she in turn developed co coping methods to push through this traumatic experience. She became an insom insomniac and an overachiever. They, s they say that the gene of addiction and or mental health illness skips a generation. In come my brother-in-law. And that's true. That's very true. It skipped mine. I didn't have my father, the side that it came on, my particular thing, came from that side and, and uh, he didn't get it. I got it. My brother is five years older than me and is currently a meth-addicted transient who has severe mental illness. Sorry to hear that. And that's called a dual diagnosis. He started self-medicating at a young age. My parents struggled with him because as a teen, he started drinking and being rebellious and apathetic to their worry for him. I grew up witnessing many heated arguments between my parents and him. 
I hated the conflict and the yelling. I began to resent my brother for always causing worry and stress to my parents. Not wanting to disappoint my mom, I allowed her to control me and set up a path for me that wasn't of my choice. I was a good girl all the way into my early 20s. I was going to college, working at a great job, and living with my parents under their rules. I was against alcohol use in excess and against most hard drugs. Then I met the man who is now my ex-husband. This guy, over the course of 10 years, destroyed my confidence and would question my loyalty towards him on a constant basis. He introduced me to drugs. I was a pot smoker long before I met him, and still am. So cannabis, cannabis did not bother me. He was into weed too, but he was also into other drugs. Drugs that I had previously passed on whenever the opportunity to do them arose. We had such a trauma-bonded relationship. Like I said, he would constantly question my loyalty and my love for him. He demanded I prove my devotion by enduring an endless roller coaster of drama. But I became addicted to him. I believe it is due to my mom and would make me f I believe it is due to how my mom would make me feel like I had to prove myself to her and the guilt that would come with any protest from me. I hated to hear her yelling at me and I hated to hear him yelling at me. So I would bend over and take their total manipulation of me and my empathetic nature up the ass. Just to avoid any, sor any sort of conflict with them, I cowered it away from their domine domineering narcissistic personalities and just did what I was told. Where my mom was concerned, she hated him. She hated he was influence influencing me to change my usually consistent behavior. She warned she warned me about him, and I dismissed her as being judgmental and hateful in her blunt opinion of him. She didn't like losing her control over me, but she and my dad also knew that he was bad news for me. So, began to feel ashamed. So, I began to feel ashamed. I began to live two separate lives. I was... Hang on. I was single and just hanging out with friends where my parents were concerned. I was in a committed and long-term relationship where he was concerned. I was constantly torn between both of these lives I was living. I was constant, constantly lying to my parents. I went three to four years of making them think I had stopped seeing my ex now. Wow, that had to be exhausting. I was the daughter they wanted me to date, wanted me to be, or wanted to think I was. I was so ashamed of myself for lying to them for hiding him and for feeling like both of their opinions mattered more than mine. That's, there's that ugly word again, shame. I became so unhappy that I made the unwitting, unwitting descent into the world of opiate painkiller addiction. I had some dental issues and instead of fixing the issues, my dentist prescribed antibiotics and Percocet for me to get over the toothache I was having. I began to like how I f felt when those pills were kicking in my system. I felt like, I feel that like, you know, people get diff addicted to things because of their different like physiological makeups. Like, some people can drink alcohol and they don't become an alcoholic. Some people drink alcohol and they're alcoholic. Some people take pain pills or opiate, you know, whatever, or do whatever. They don't get addicted. Some do. I think it has to do with, you know, if you're prone or whatever. I felt like they gave me a happiness that I was longing to feel. I longed for a, dis a distraction from the shitty life of lies that was my life. Although our relationship... All through our relationship, I was a breadwinner. I was the breadwinner. I made a pretty good salary at a job I had for a very long time. I had paid my dues to get where I was at that job. I worked hard and was a, a reliable and thirsty employee. My ex barely maintained a string of part-time jobs. So when he introduced me to cocaine when we started dating, he also wormed his way into getting me to spend 
my hard-earned money on getting more and more cocaine for us. I take responsibility for my actions, however. I know that I wouldn't have ever touched that shit if I hadn't met him. Yeah, like, happy people don't do drugs. <laughs> I mean, they might do, like, you might have somebody, like, do co do cocaine or, like, drugs, like, on a weekend. But if you're, like, if it's part of your lifestyle, like, happy people don't do drugs or feeling, like, a void or you know it's because of mental illness or you know low self-esteem like cocaine can give you inflate your self-esteem and if you're have low self-esteem then that's where it will get you I take responsibility for my actions however I know that I wouldn't have ever touched that shit if I hadn't met him we did coke for a few years until it got to be too much for me to handle the paranoia was unlike anything I've ever experienced I do not enjoy doing it anymore. That's good. This is when the pain uh, this is when the pain pills were introduced to me and I opted for the warm motivation of opiates than the tweaked out non-functional sting of the stimulants. I am the one who responds to depressants much better than I do to the stimulants. Yes, um alcohol is a depressant um the pain pills are like a, like a downer if you will and like Xanax and stuff and then some people need um, the stimulants they like that better anyway along with my addiction I introduced him to how wonderful these little pills were long story short over the space of span of four years we lost everything I lost my good paying job because I couldn't work with having the pill without having pills for the day he lost his he lost his part-time job because if I wasn't working, what did he have to do? We lost our cars to the repo man. We lost our apartment. I lost my soul for quite a few years. Yeah, drugs will take that from you. I never had, I, I'm not going to say I've ne never done drugs in my life. Of course I did. Um, but I was always able to, you know, because I would just do it for fun. It was like my mental health or, you know, well, I got diagnosed with bipolar, bipolar disorder well past when I was over, you know, doing the fun stuff. Um, I lost my soul for a few years. While we were losing the life we built, I built, I discovered I was pregnant. I was almost 30 and I felt the maternal pull to keep this beautiful baby. I honestly had decided to not keep a couple of past surprise pregnancies, something else that ripped me apart. I didn't realize it at the time, but my decision to keep her literally saved my life. I had to seek treatment because I couldn't use while pregnant. I knew I wouldn't be able to care for her properly if I was in a state of withdrawal. I got help at an outpatient facility that treated my opiate addiction with replacement synthetic opiates, subox suboxone and therapy. It was there I began to sort out my shit and take a hard look at the life I created and destroyed. I had to, I had to come to terms not only with my addiction, but it, but it's through the counseling and psychiatric evaluations that I was first diagnosed with chronic depression, with bouts of mania, bipolar, and PTSD. I was so fortunate to have my parents to fall back on when I made the choice to leave my ex now. As I got better, he got worse. He became physically abus abusive in addition to his already constant stream of mental abuse. I knew I wouldn't want to be around him anymore. I knew he was a soul sucker. I knew he was selfish and really didn't want to stand up, really didn't want to stand up and be a man dad to me and her. Even though she's been my worst critic, she has always been in my corner where he and my daughter are concerned. I really, I really see that I wouldn't have been able to escape the shitty life I saw in order for us if it wasn't for my parents and their unconditional love. I had lied to them. I had stolen from them. I had become an entirely different person than the daughter they knew me to be. I did not like the version of myself that I had become. I, be I began to learn about my mental illness and disease of addiction. I began to f forgive myself and to stop feeling guilt and shame over anything in my past. 
it took years it took a few years and a hell of a lot of journals for me to work out all of this stuff I had issues with medication for my issues and went through horrible bouts of de depressive states where I couldn't get out of bed my parents allowed my daughter and I to live with them they allowed me they allowed me time to work on myself without placing demands on me I tried working at various part-time jobs throughout those years and I always ended up quitting or being close to being sacked I was put on so many different types of mood stabler, stabilizers and antidepressant drugs it can take a while to find the right cocktail and I always ended up quitting or being close oh, I was put on so many types of mood stabilizers and antidepressant drugs but still couldn't get my shit together I decided to seek a second opinion I realized that it, I realized it was okay for me to do that I was still seeing a counselor at least twice a month and getting my suboxone from this place but I needed a different approach to my mental state and problems I wasn't being an I wasn't being an attentive mother my lack of wanting to stay awake or get out of bed really made me dis distant in those three to four years of her life I was also dealing with detaching myself from my ex we had been together for a long time and even got married when we found out we were gonna try and have a baby I had to leave him and go back to him a couple of times to finally realize that we we deserved so much more than what he had to offer us I finally saw what my parents warned me about him it took going through a lot of soul searching to get this realization I finally hired an attorney my parents gladly paid for him and got a divorce from that good-for-nothing man but being newly single a first-time mother and dealing with long belts of depression made me vulnerable I stupidly believed I could find comfort in meaningless sex with almost strangers and getting attached far too quickly to far too quickly to unavailable men who just wanted to have me around to fuck I actually got to a point where I wanted a man to save me from the dread and drudgery of my day-to-day -day existence Ugh. so I sought a second opinion from an independent psychiatrist he listened to me he listened when I explained that the drugs I was on made me feel like a huge cloud was over hanging over my head and the only way I could escape the pain of my days was by seeking cheap and fast thrills well, that's probably from those that I am just saying that's probably when she would hit the mania or hypomania whatever she wrote while in a vulnerable state I met a guy online he was a recovering opiate addict like me and was totally in sync with me and I got swept up in his love bombing oh God I was adjusting to a new medication I was taken off all the mood stabilizers and given the mild stimulant drug Wellbutrin I began to feel more and more like myself as I adjusted to this new medication I fell in love fast with a with a dude who told me he found his soulmate in me yeah well it wasn't long until he started devaluing me and making me feel inadequate I began reverting back to old thoughts about myself and how I had and how I had to do whatever he wanted me to do so I could keep him happy and keep him interested in me we dated only eight months and ended up together for six years all along he blurred <coughs> excuse me all along he blurred lines where our relationship was concerned only to get mad at me for reading into his actions he mind fucked me this is when I learned about narcissism this is when I began to undergo intense therapy with this new psychiatrist he really focused on my PTSD I had been subject I had been subjected to 10 years of stress and anxiety caused by my ex's horrible abuse of me I developed these untrue beliefs about myself I didn't know where my worth could be found I had I had put I had I had put my worth into other people for so long and had been disappointed repeatedly and through this intense cognitive therapy treatment I received for my PTSD partnered with a new medication I, be, I began to make acknowledgments and real 
and realize hard truths about myself. When I acted the way I did, why I acted the way I did, why I always felt shame and guilt in whatever I did, what caused me to fall for men who took advantage, what caused me for, what caused me to fall for men who took advantage of me, I started to see that it that I, if I wanted my life to be different, then I have to start doing things differently. I have to break those bad habits that cause me to turn a blind eye to red flags and abuse. It's when I actually acknowledged everything I have gone through in life and started to learn how to reprogram my brain and rediscover my authentic self. I eventually got away from the narcissist. Yay! I eventually realized I needed to be I need to be alone and I need to concentrate on raising my daughter and rebuilding my life. That leads me to the present. I have been single and still working on myself, giving myself time to heal without anything distracting me. I turned 40 in 2021 and I'm so very proud and happy to say that I feel the happiest I've ever felt in a long time. Yes. Yes. I've learned to love and accept myself and realize my limitations and desires in life. Yeah, be kind to yourself. We do have to be kind to ourselves and not put the expect, you know, such high expectations on ourselves and just be kind. <laughs> um and realize my limitations and desires in life. I don't ever want to live a lie ever again. I don't ever want to live in the shadow of shame and fear of being rejected. I have realized my worth spirit spiritually and also acknowledged what brings me joy in my physical reality. Wow, I cannot believe my I poured my heart out to a stranger like I just did. But it feels so damn good to actually look at myself and be proud of who I am and what I've gone through. I wouldn't have arrived at this point without having gone through all the rest. Absolutely. And her, she knows her story can help. Don't get me wrong. Things in life aren't 100% perfect. But I've been able to hold, ta- hold down a full-time job for the last four years. And I've managed to build a foundation on which to build my life. I am still young enough to look forward to the future. I am not afraid to be alone. I'm not afraid. Yeah, you can't, it's hard. People, like she said, people put value on themselves based on what other people say or think about them. You're the best person to put the value on your life. And and if you're honest about it, you say, you know what? I'm not happy where I am. That's your honest, you know, once you get over, uh, how do I want to say this? Doing self-inventory or reality checks on yourself is very important. Not the things you tell yourself, but if you just write things down and do a good self-inventory and assessment, that's a great start. I am not afraid to meet my needs first, sometimes, sans my daughter's needs. Anyway, I have spent a long time on this email. Thank you for reading. No, thank you for writing. Do what you'd like with my story. It's not special or unique. Yes, it is. It's... They're all unique, but it's not unique because there's a million people out there going through it and it makes people feel better. But it's most definitely got a strong plot line of drama and resolution. Guess I can say the Countess triumphs. Yes, she does. Thank you so much. I feel happy to share what I've gone through, even if I did jump around a bit. So happy I found your channel and I look forward to your content in the future. You've got a fan in me, for sure. Well, you've got a fan in me and a... Who, however many thousands of people watch this videos are your new fans, Countess, and your triumph. So um, that was very nice. If anybody wants to write in, I'll be able to be ch- I'll be checking this email regularly, and like I said, it's going to be Sundays and Wednesdays. So if you want to share, um, narcissistriumphs at gmail.com. Hope everybody liked it. Hope to hear the comments, and I hope this inspired some at least one person today and helped. So, <clears throat> since this I didn't get this out yesterday, I will be I will be releasing another one. Uh, what time is it? It's almost noon where I am, so probably re- release it. Um, you know, early evening. So, because I like to 
you know, or a little later because I like to pe people to be able to watch this stuff because, you know, if they're released too quickly, they kind of get lost in the shuffle. So uh, thanks, everybody. And like I said, I'm not a doctor. I just share, you know, what I've learned. But, you know, I think everybody knows that. And I wanted to clear up that medicine thing. So looking forward to, and I'll be doing another, like, businessy thing sometime today, you know, in a couple hours. Uh, after everybody digests this. So thanks and talk to you later. Great story. The next one is great. Well, they're all great. So talk to you soon.